It is 11 a.m. in Paris, and I see lots of participants are joining, but uh, I think it's time to start. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depends from where you are joining. My name is Camila Sfugiatolik, and I'm Coordination Officer in the European Marine Biological Resource Center. And first, I would like to thank uh, for all the registered uh, people that you want to attend today's event, which is Navigating the Blue Economy, Insights from the Ocean Observation Data. We have a great interest uh, in this event, as yesterday evening we counted 388 registrations from 93 different countries, which means it's nearly the representation of the half of the countries uh, of the world today. If I may have an uh, agenda, we will go through, uh, through it. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so we will kick off with the EMBRC welcoming. Uh, later, we will have opening remarks for around 10 minutes, and then we will move to our main interest, which is the moderated panel discussion of more or less 80 minutes. It will be followed by the short question and answer session, and then we hope to close with the 10 minutes for concluding remarks, and the event will be over at uh, 1 p.m. Paris time. Thank you for sharing. Uh, at this, so I would like to tell you that this meeting will be recorded and the recording will be available at EMBRC YouTube channel after this event. I would also like to invite audience to put their question in the Zoom Q&A section that you can see below. Uh, those questions, uh, they will be addressed in the 10 minutes question and answer session uh, at the event. But uh, how we are going to handle the questions? So we are going to try and answer, if time allows, from two to four most voted ones. Of course, we will restrict questions to those that are directly related to this event. So please submit your question and vote for the ones that you like by clicking like button just below them. So I think this, uh, this is all for the housekeeping rules that I had for today. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Nicolas Pade, he is Executive Director of the European Marine Biological Center. The floor is yours, Nicolas. Thank you very much, Camilla, and a warm welcome to everyone who's joined in today. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, be moderating this session today that we've called Navigating the Blue Economy, Insights from Ocean Observation Data. So EMBRC is, uh, is a research infrastructure, so we're not a research institute, but rather our role is to support and enable marine biological research. As part of this role, our mission is to further and deepen knowledge on marine environment and marine biological resources. And so we have a firm belief that it's important uh, to have a good representation of life in the ocean and indeed marine biology as part of our global observation network today. As such, we've been working to establish a professional, structured and standardized contribution to biological data to the global, ocean, uh, global observation initiatives. And through this, we have become members of the UN Decade of the Ocean, Ocean Bio uh, Biomolecular Observation Network, OBON, and within that, our observation activities is an officially recognized project. So as part of uh, this aim to drive more biological data into our observation systems, we're very happy to be hosting this event today. It's part, as a context, it's organized by the G20. Uh, we're current under the Brazilian presidency where they have created the ocean dialogues in order to throw a spotlight on the importance of the oceans moving forward in terms of enabling sustainable exploitation of the ocean, as well as making sure that we can continue to use it in for the many years to come. So today we hope to touch on five major points as part of this dialogue. First of all, the role of ocean data in terms of biodiversity uh, conservation, its management and its sustainable utilization. We want to touch on the data-driven strategies for ecosystem health. So how do we make sure that the data we generate can be used very thoroughly? We want to look at into feeding the future. We know that the oceans is an extremely important part um, in terms of feeding many people around the world and remains one of the most important source of protein as well for a huge part of our planet. But we also want to look into how we can get more people involved in this. This can't be an endeavor that is only represented by a small number of people. So we'll be also be looking into cross sectoral collaboration for ocean sustainability and how we can drive the data that we collect towards various stakeholders, particularly those that are making decisions today. 
Finally, we will also be looking into how do we make this sustainable. Our current observation system is running on project funding largely. And in order to have good predictability and insight into the oceans, it's also crucial that this is sustained um, and funded in a sustainable manner. So to move uh, things forward today, we're going to have an introduction shortly. What I would just like to uh, say as well is that the outcome of this discussion will form the backbone of a white paper that we will be submitting to the G20. Um, the different ocean dialogues will be contributing to this final document, um, which by the end of the summer, we should see a policy recommendations on the oceans coming from the G20, and this will be a part of it. So with no further ado, I would like to move to our first speaker who will also be introducing, uh, introducing our session today and giving us a bit of background. So it is my pleasure to introduce Kila Parti Ramakrishna. Um, he is an expert in environmental policy and international law. He currently serves as the senior advisor to the president and director of the Marine Policy Center at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute in Massachusetts, United States. His extensive career spans significant roles for the United Nations, as well as pivotal contributions to global environmental initiatives, including the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. He is also one of the co-conveners of the Ocean Dialogue. So I thank you very much for your presence today, Dr. Ramakrishna, and I would like to hand over to you for your introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for that very long introduction, and I hope uh, to do justice uh, to that. Um, let me, at the outset, uh, thank you and the panelists for their timely interest and contribution to this process. Uh, as you point out, I'm here in my capacity as one of the co-conveners of the Ocean 20 that is seeking to provide its inputs to the official G20 process. And I would also like to highlight why what we are trying to do is important and the role um, scant as it is that ocean has played in many issues that are central to what we time and again call the existential threat to life on planet earth. But before I do that, please allow me to say a few words about the pivotal role that my organization, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, is playing both in ocean observations. Uh, this is a large multi-year uh, uh, focus of the institution led by one of our senior scientists, Jim Edson, uh, funded by the National Science Foundation of the United States and engaging uh, several institutions around the world. And, um, Marine Biological Diversity, part of it led by another senior scientist, Heidi Sozik. She has been the leader of one of the uh, audacious grants uh, that uh, talked about the mesopelagic zone um, and the importance of marine biodiversity to just about everything that we do. And on top of all this, uh, bringing it all together is a third initiative called the Ocean Vital Science Network. It's led by one more senior scientist, Susan Weifels and others. Uh, it's an institution of about 1,100 scientists and engineers dealing with uh, just about every aspect of uh, uh, interest to uh, marine life. Uh, but I thought I would highlight these three things in particular that is of relevance to uh, this group. Um, what I thought I would do now is uh, say a little bit about the uh, Oceans 20, how it came to be, and what is its link with the, the group of 20 countries um, and uh, how uh, what we are trying to do through this ocean dialogue is going to help us uh, move the issue forward. Now, what is important to keep in mind is that the main reason why G20 was founded, it was founded in 1999 after the Asian financial crisis as a forum for the finance ministers and central bank governors to discuss global economic and financial issues. But over time, it has become the body to address just about every major issue facing the global community. Uh, so no surprise then 
when you read G20 um, final communique or look to the process itself, you would see a kind of a whole of government approach. You know, it's not just foreign ministers and finance ministers meeting prior to the meetings of the heads of state and government, but environment, transportation, various other departments um, coming together and then talking about issues of concern. So therefore, it is natural that we would want the G20 to be paying particular attention to ocean matters as well. But the unfortunate part about ocean is, on the one hand, we have concluded what has come to be known as the constitution for the ocean with the adoption of the UN Con Convention on Law of the Sea in 1982. Uh, it has somehow stayed a little bit outside the number of issues that we want to consider uh, as priority items or as um, I began calling them uh, an existential threat to um, life on planet Earth. Um, and that hasn't changed um, all that much since the adoption of the Law of the Sea Convention. Um, we did have a new agreement in uh, last year that was adopted, uh, popularly known as the BBNJ Treaty. But then that also has taken about 20 years of negotiations. But even that has not done as well as one would like to connect climate impacts to marine biodiversity and the implications of that for a lot of other matters. Uh, the, the Sustainable Development Goals adopted in 2015, um, you know, with a 15 year time span has given one whole goal, goal 14 for life, uh, uh, for, for ocean matters. And as has oftentimes been said, it is the least funded of all the Sustainable Development Goals. And it has either uh, ill or poorly defined targets and indicators in meeting the goal. Uh, so all of this leads us to thinking about, I mean, did, uh, let me say one more thing, you know, the climate convention, um, important as it is, it has taken uh, until the last couple of years, um, very little attention to ocean matters in, in terms of the role that ocean plays in stabilizing the global climate system. So all of this leads us to um, G20 conferences and how uh, it was in the beginning a bit episodic in the sense that um, in the context of food, in the context of biodiversity, in the context of climate, uh, folks talked about ocean matters in G20, but it is only with the Indonesia's chairing of G20 that the O20 became a reality. Um, India that's followed uh, the Indonesia um, has taken uh, matters to uh, a new heights by adopting uh, what has come to be known as the Chennai High Level Principles for a Sustainable and Resilient Blue Ocean Based Economy. Um, and I would urge all of you to take a good close look at it. There are a number of uh, principles that are directly relevant to what you're trying to do in this panel discussion. And let me just read uh, one sentence from the preambular part that is of direct relevance. It says, recognizing the criticality of the ocean and its resources and the growing threats to marine environment and biodiversity from climate change, marine pollution, unsustainable exploitation and illegal activities that affect the marine environment, the G20 high-level principles may be implemented by the G20 members. And it goes on to say uh, how it should uh, support developing countries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that, those principles were adopted in the next year to the declaration. Uh, and so it has, uh, uh, it is a, an important uh, uh, contribution to the process. Now, uh, my colleagues from the outside, you know, in the World Economic Forum, the UN Global Compact, were really thrilled to be working with a very high energy and commitment of our Brazilian colleagues, led by my good friend, uh, Professor Alexander Tura from University of Sao Paulo, uh, and all of his various colleagues in really putting the ocean agenda on even a higher plane. So what should 
you be saying to G20 through this process um, that we call these ocean dialogues. Um, so what we really need to do is uh, talk about not dealing with matters in a, in a siloed framework and look at the interconnections that exist between one and the other. Um, as I began by saying, G20 is a high-level political and policy-setting body, so it would be helpful to count your key recommendations either as touching on governance and our finance with the following as avenues to get the message in. Well, G20 should support really a comprehensive approach um, and uh, draw upon science and action. Um, and uh, you call it the science policy interface. Or, um, it, it, it's important that the decisions that they take be couched in the uh, knowledge that all of you bring to uh, the issues that we are talking about. Uh, the G20 countries need to act as the, the kind of forum that it is, you know, the, the, the major forum to get these issues addressed. And um, uh, oftentimes it's a bit easier to take decisions in G20 than in the body of the 193 countries uh, that are members of the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, and their footprint on everything to do with ocean is as large as can be, uh, and therefore their role is naturally uh, important. And once they begin taking on these decisions, whether you call that the coalition of the willing or whatever, they have the ability to inspire and help other countries um, to move forward in that direction. Clearly, more investment is needed, and this is clearly a message to G20 countries, um, both in terms of implementing the SDG 14, uh, but also, as Nicholas start, talked about, the ocean decade uh, and many of the things that we are trying to accomplish in that. But it is not only the ocean decade. These days, there have been a series of conferences, um, one led by the former Secretary of State John Kerry in the United States called Our Ocean Conferences. And then the, the other led by the United Nations, the UN Ocean Conference. Um, the third one is due to take place in this country, in France uh, next year. Um, and um, so uh, what they are to accomplish, I mean, the G20 has a very profound role uh, in terms of advancing an ambitious uh, agenda to UNOC 3, um, and that may include uh, many of the issues that you're talking about because they are also of direct relevance to the BBNJ Treaty, which the French government and the United Nations and Costa Rica hope will be ready for um, uh, entering into force uh, by the time UNOC 3 uh, comes together. And finally, um, it's important that the role that you play as scientific community and the role that civil society plays in terms of the impact that they themselves face by not paying attention to uh, these critical issues, uh, bringing partnerships as a key message to G20 and inclusion and support to developing countries uh, is, I think, a very key uh, message. Uh, so um, it, it is really an important opportunity, and this Ocean Dialogue is coming just at the right time. Uh, we just completed a midterm evaluation of our own work and what needs to be done. And we are all very much looking forward to the recommendations that you give us so that we can properly input that into the official process and wait for an outcome that uh, is satisfactory to all of us and paves the way forward in terms of um, uh, ensuring ocean sustainability and its role in um, presenting solutions to a lot of the problems that the world community is facing right now. With those remarks, I thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you, and I'm very much looking forward to uh, the presentations and the discussion afterwards. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramakrishna. Really appreciate the introduction and setting the context for our discussion today. It's very helpful. So with the 
After the introduction, we can now move on to our panel discussion. So we have a number of panelists with us today that will take you over the bit more than an hour uh, towards the conclusion. Um, and so I would like to start by introducing our different panelists. So first of all, we have Claire Joly. Claire is the head of the Ocean Economy and Space Economy Directorate for Science, Technology and Innovation at the OECD. She manages the OECD initiatives on the economic uh, and innovative aspects of ocean and the space sector, supporting international agendas for sustainable growth. Welcome, Claire. We have Zoe Constantino, who is joining us from the European Commission. Zoe is the Policy Officer at the Commission's Directorate General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, also known as DG Mare. She's focusing on marine observations, data management, and the European Marine Observation and Data Network, EMOTNET. Welcome, Zoe. We have Pooja Mahapatra, who is the Principal Advisor for Climate and Nature at the company Fugro. Pooja leads remote sensing solutions at Fugro, focusing on climate change adaptation and coastal resilience. Welcome to you. We have Fabrice Nutt, who is joining us. Uh, he is a CNRS senior scientist at the Station Biologique de Roscoff, which is part of Sorbonne University. He is specializing in plankton ecology, particularly focusing on molecular and imaging techniques to explore symbiotic relationships amongst plantic, uh, planktonic organisms. Welcome, Fabrice. We have Ralph Rayner with us. He's serving as a pro, um, professorial research fellow at the London School of Economics. He contributes to a number of international research programs concerned with understanding the scale and scope of the ocean economy and the role of ocean observations in supporting the safe, effective and environmental sound use of ocean resources. And finally, we have Natalie Roth. Natalie is the founder and managing director of the company for climate. Um, she leverages over 18 years of expertise in environmental finance and international carbon markets to develop carbon management strategies for both the private and governmental sectors. Welcome, Natalie. So thank you to the panel for joining us today. As you can see, we have a very broad and diverse group of people representing many different backgrounds, ranging from the private sector, government, uh, super government and science. Um, and since we have such a broad uh, group of people, I would like to start to ask each of the panelists just to outline from their perspective and their sector what uh, marine biodiversity means to them and in their field. So uh, I'll go in the same order that I did the introductions. And so uh, we can start with Claire, please. So hello, hello, everybody. Thanks for the invitation. So what marine biodiversity means for the OECD? Yeah. Well, it's, it's actually an important focus for us uh, due to its significant impacts on economies, uh, ecosystems, of course, and human well-being. We have different teams at the OECD and we all look at biodiversity in our activities. We, at the OECD, we underline the need for you know, integrated policies, international cooperation to balance economic development with environmental conservation for long-term benefits. And this includes really concrete measures um, in terms, for instance, of fishing, uh, we have a committee on fisheries where we do quite a bit on supporting countries to curb subsidies that contribute to overcapacity and overfishing through the WTO process, but also uh, as part of the work on the OECD committee in fisheries. In terms of conservation, habitat conservation in particular, we have a lot of work going on right now on supporting the CBD processes with new indicators. Another angle is mitigating pollution um, and obviously supporting then biodiversity there. There's a lot of OECD work right now to develop evidence and support uh, the, so the plastics treaty negotiations. So you see many different angles where biodiversity is really at the core of many of the work that we do. In addition, uh, at the OECD, we host a large database that provides actually a lot of um, uh, useful instruments regulations that are tracked, uh, where we see their implementation, their effectiveness across OECD countries and many other countries around the world, where we can actually provide, you know, information on how, uh, for instance, polluter pay principles are addressed in different countries. So again, a source of information, of data to actually support, uh, hopefully, uh, improved governance and support uh, biodiversity conservation. Thank you, Claire. That is indeed a very broader perspective. Thank you. 
Um, so we can move over to Zoe, please. Sorry, Zoe, we don't seem to be able to hear you. Okay, and we'll leave Zoe to try and sort her microphone out and we'll jump over to Pooja, please. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, thank you very much for uh, well, for uh, this very, very important topic that I think uh, we will get a lot of insights in in the coming uh, um, uh, hour or so uh, from various different perspectives, actually. So marine diverse, uh, biodiversity obviously refers to the variety and variability of life within the ocean and all of its complex ecosystems. So obviously we're looking at the range of species, whether you're talking about the tiniest plankton to the largest of whales, but also their habitats and the genetic diversity within these species and, and the, the, the ecological processes that obviously sustain these species. Now, Fugro, we are a geodata specialist. So, so we are all about the data, the ocean observation data that goes into um, um, uh, quantifying some of these uh, some of these parameters. Um, so, for us, mar marine biodiversity signifies a vast repository of data points um, that actually reflect the health and the vitality of, for instance, marine ecosystems. So, it's really not about just cataloging species; it's about understanding the relationships between the different organisms their habitats and the various environmental factors um, that influence their survival and prosperity, which obviously with climate change means uh, this is a, a changing uh, a changing space. Um, so basically you can't manage what you don't measure. Um, so uh, that's the angle we come from. Without comprehensive ocean observation data, we, we really cannot accurately assess the state of marine biodiversity. So uh, what, what we focus on is monitoring changes so, for instance, tracking shifts in, in, in species distribution, abundance, behavior, and so on, and behavior to, to natural and human induced changes. Um, we assess health. Um, so, for instance, we evaluate the condition of marine habitats. Um, I'll give you some examples of this, uh, hopefully, in the process of the conversation. Um, we, we build models to predict outcomes. Um, so, model uh, potential future scenarios based on current trends and current data. Uh, we work with uh, with partners to inform conservation activities, so we provide evidence-based insights for creating and enforcing, for instance, marine protected areas and other conservation strategies. Um, and it's really about guiding sustainable use of, uh, of, of ocean resources, so it, really ensuring that economic activities such as fishing and aquaculture are conducted in a way that really maintains biodiversity, and, and we do that through data. Um, so yeah, essentially we are measuring the ocean's well-being and by mapping, modeling and monitoring the critical ocean variables um, and, and biodiversity, we aim to provide our stakeholders with the data that is necessary to make informed decisions that balance ecological integrity with economic interests um, and ultimately contributing to a sustainable blue economy. That's, uh, that's the goal. Thank you very much. And Fabrice? Yes, hello everyone. So, yeah, well, I'm coming from academia, right? And um, so for me, well, biodiversity is pretty much what 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 has been said before. It's the diversity of the of life, biodiversity, right? The diversity of life, the different life units considered as uh, organisms. But that, uh, I think, it's, uh, we're trying in the academia to look at the different uh, level of diversity, like going from the uh, 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 population, organisms, uh, even like the intra-specific uh, biodiversity. So you know you can look at biodiversity at different at different um, uh, defi I mean uh, resolution, and that that's what we're trying to do. Because as it has been said uh, in the academia, diversity also is we look at diversity of functions, of behavior of these organisms, and uh, and basically what we're trying to do is not necessarily uh, what we. Uh, what one would think about at first, for instance, uh, we are trying to consider like mixotrophy, you know, these, these organisms that can do different functions, that can be plants, that can be animals at the same time, whatever. And, and this kind of diversity is very important to consider as well. Um, and then obviously the ecosystem and habitats. Maybe, maybe two points that I'd like to, uh, that I think are important to have in mind when, when discussing marine biodiversity. And 
again, it's a, like an academic point of view, but I think it's also something that is of interest for the broader community. It's like, I think what, what is very important, what we discover is that the connection between the lack units, right, the interaction between the biodiversity uh, uh, pieces, let's say, uh, and also that most of the biodiversity is actually uh, uh, microscopic. So and the, I think I think this is the key point. Maybe we can discuss that later. But uh, and, uh, if we only care about what we see, we are actually missing uh, ninety nine percent of the of, of the biodiversity, and this is important. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I, I can say. Other way, I see biodiversity. Biodiversity. Yeah. Thank you for that insight, Fabrice. Uh, we can move over to Ralph. You're muted, Ralph. The challenge of coming near to the end, um, <laughs> but everything's been pretty much said. But I think um, I think what we've heard is some strict scientific definitions of biological diversity. Um, but I think when used in the context of a biodiversity crisis, what we're really trying to do is using biodiversity as a, as a proxy for um, the importance of moving towards sustainable use of ocean natural capital and protection of ocean ecosystem services. So it's a nice, neat way of encapsulating those two challenges in just a couple of words rather than a long sentence. It's my turn to not find the unmute button. Thank you very much, Ralph. And we can move over to Natalie. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Nicholas. And for also thank you for inviting me to speak, speak here today. I mean, we heard a lot about the, the goals that we need to achieve uh, for climate, for biodiversity, for the oceans. But in order to achieve them, we really have to look at the financing. You know, where does the financing come from, and what role does biodiversity data play into into um, getting the financing out and getting credible financing out to uh, achieve these goals? I mean, we have uh, uh, working since twenty years in the nexus of environment and finance. Uh, and have since uh, 2016 17 started to work more concretely on oceans through an IUCN initiative, which is the Blue Natural Capital Financing Facility. Uh, so we have gotten into the, this topic much closer. And what I can say is what I have observed over the past five years there is enormous growth in guidances, in taxonomies, in standards out there for financing the blue economy. Uh, it really has started in 2018 with UNEP. Uh, issuing the Sustainable Blue Economy Financing Principles, which uh, is really the cornerstone of, of many of the discussions around uh, blue financing instruments. Uh, also following in 2019, we had the first blue bond, uh, the Seychelles Blue Bond, which you might also uh, remember in 2022, the ADB, uh, uh, Asian Development Bank, launched the first joint framework, uh, green and blue framework for, for bonds, which uh, was also a cornerstone. And building on that, the IFC has issued in 2022 guidelines for blue finance uh, in order to provide a list of eligible use of proceeds to support private investments uh, applicable to the green bond principles, but also green loan principles of the International um, uh, ICMA Capital Markets Association, general guidance on blue bonds, uh, on, on green bonds. Uh, following that, we had in 2023 the ICMA itself uh, releasing guidance on uh, blue themed bonds to help unlock further finance for sustainable ocean, looking at use of proceeds bonds, but also sustainability linked bonds. So there has a lot been going on over the five years, uh, nearly every year a new guidance coming out, but not to forget, of course, also guidance on what is a sustainable activity, what is a sustainable activity in the ocean, in the marine space, and here we have, of course, uh, the EU taxonomy, who has as one of its core six um, environmental object, um, areas the sustainable use and protection of water and marine resources, giving a whole list of what is 
sustainable in this space, what type of activity can be considered sustainable, and which, which really provides guidance to um, many other initiatives, which we will probably speak uh, later on in this session about this is sustainable finance disclosure regulation, etc. Um, but I also want to say that uh, the EU taxonomy also focuses, of course, on climate, climate mitigation, adaptation, and on other environmental objectives, and also in ac activities that are active in this space, always need to demonstrate that they do no significant harm also to the water and marine re um, resources. So uh, the significant contribution and do no significant harm and uh, um, managing the environmental and social aspects are also key, are always key in, in any financing instruments that, that we see um, coming up. Thank you, Natalie. I'm glad you also touched on the point about sustainability because that is a word that gets thrown around a lot with many different meanings. And last but not least, uh, the perspective from uh, Zoe and DG Mare, please. I hope we're still in the same question that I left you, Nicolas. Absolutely. Uh, and the in, in importance of um, marine biodiversity for your, for our organization. So for DG Mare, I want to start from, from DG Mare before going to the commission. Uh, and for DG Mare, marine biodiversity is uh, the core of our work. Uh, both uh, uh, regarding the management, uh, the sustainable management of European fisheries uh, and marine protected areas and uh, the health of the ecosystems in order uh, to, to be able to deliver on these resources that are the management of which is an exclusive competence of the European Commission and, and the European Union. So this is a key part of the work. And then you can see that this work is also related with multiple other things because marine biodiversity is very relevant for policies as the Maritime Special Planning Directive and then going outside from DG Environment to Marine Strategy Framework Directive, uh, to Water Framework Directive and Habitats Directive. Uh, marine biodiversity is key for the development of blue economy because it is, uh, it is our main matter in, in which uh, we need to develop. Uh, so we need to be sustainable uh, and uh, for this reason, the European Commission has a multitude of actions that are related to marine biodiversity, from the common fisheries policy and the data collection framework, uh, to the work that is done through the European Marine Observation and Data Network in biodiversity monitoring, but also to actions that are related to the protection of marine protected areas, and data that are coming from research infrastructures like your own and end up uh, in infrastructure like the European Digital Twin Ocean that aim to provide sustainable management of marine ecosystems and resources. So uh, it is a key part of the work weaved in multiple different initiatives. Uh, and I think that we're going to discuss how in a changing scenery uh, we can uh, support uh, ocean observation of biological resources as much as possible. Thank you very much, Zoe. Um, so thank you for those perspectives. And it's really interesting to see how everybody comes at this with a understanding what biodiversity is, but ultimately looking at a different aspect or seeking to manage a different aspect for a different group of stakeholders. Um, I do think it's important, though, to also try and get a good understanding around why it's so important. So Fabrice, perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about why you consider that it's really important that we include biodiversity and in ocean observation today. I mean, we've been doing ocean observation for decades now, but the state of biological integration is limited. And so what do you think we can really gain by including more biological data? <clears throat> yeah, well, you're, you're right. I mean, uh, I mean, we've been observing the ocean, the ocean since uh, many years, and uh, and uh, but not so much of the bio biodiversity data. And uh, I, I guess we're all convinced here about the importance of biodiversity, right? I mean, it's been mentioned in the uh, in the, our definitions of what we understand by uh, biodiversity, and uh, and so maybe the question would be then, uh, why don't we uh, why don't we monitor biodiversity? Uh, as we would do for like uh, uh, 
uh, temperature or salinity or whatever other uh, oceanic parameters. And I think that's the key. I mean, and uh, obviously, I mean, that, to me at least, uh, one of the reasons that uh, the, the the biodiversity by nature are, 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 are complex in terms of like data acquisition, data analysis. You know, it's not like a sensor that you put in the water and then you measure that biodiversity. Where you're dealing with so many uh, different kinds of organisms. And, and as I said before, the, the most of the very large part of the biodiversity is microscopic. <laughs> so you, 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 and then you, you don't, you, you don't uh, uh, get to that biodiversity so easily. So, and then, and then we, in the academia, at least we've been developing new tools since a few years to, uh, to, be, to, to, to try to tackle this and to, to get a more like, a comprehensive view of that biodiversity, and then we can talk about that later. But I think just to answer your question, Nicholas, is that I think it's important because you know, you know, uh, I mean, what biodiversity is the key for uh, uh, the ecosystem functioning, right? I mean, and then every time there is a like a uh, unbalanced biodiversity for some reason, there is like a crash in aquaculture, in fisheries, in whatever. Uh, I mean, it has a strong impact on the on the. Uh, Human, uh, uh, human activities, basically. So uh, I guess, uh, yeah, bi biodiversity, uh, as I said, and the interaction between these units of the biodiversity is, is key for so, so many um, uh, human uh, interests, for instance. And, and, and so, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's I guess, uh, uh, why is it important to, to, to monitor it and to monitor it on the long term, not only, and then there are, Different way to monitor biodiversity, right? I mean, there is either you look at one specific species that you don't want or that you want to see, like invasive species, and that is kind of one kind of approach you use, or you want to look at the, the biodiversity as a whole, like at the community that you are uh, dealing with and how this community evolves through time, whether there is a, 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 a perturbation, like a sudden perturbation, or whether it's like climate change, which is more like, and so there is this notion of, of time scales as well that you, um, so yeah, that, I don't know if it's answering your, your question, maybe it's just a starting point for a discussion, mm -hmm. but I think biodiversity is a, a, it's kind of tricky to to address as a, as a, as a data, I mean, as a, yeah, information. So maybe that's why it's so complex and it's not there, we're not there yet, actually. So if we, if we take this complexity into mind and the perspective that uh, that Fabrice just presented, Claire, I'd like to bring you in here. I mean, you you deal with uh, with many governments across the, uh, the planet and the oceans are, of course, global. It's something we can't manage just in Europe or in Asia or in, us, in, the, or in the United States. So what are the potential barriers that are in place in terms of putting in place a global system. I mean, the different regions have different priorities. There are different means. How do we go about actually putting in place an observation system that is global? What are the steps to doing so? And also, I mean, do people share this view of the importance of biodiversity across the globe in your experience? Well, I, th I think, uh, you know, building on what was just said, I think there's a recognition that uh, you know we need to better track ocean health and looking at ocean health, we need to look at living organisms. <laughs> I think that's going to be uh, crucial. Uh, that's crucial. Um, the the goose, uh, the global ocean observing system, has done a you know has taken great stride in actually bringing different actors together. Uh, but it's been very much in terms of physical oceanography so far. There's much more work going on right now in actually coordinating. Uh, actors across different disciplines, because obviously when looking at biodiversity, you have many different scientific teams that, you know, may not really talk to each other also. Um, but in terms of the main steps um, that we're seeing, um, they may seem very obvious, uh, but, uh, you know, establishing common goals, uh, that's already a first important step. And this is something that we're seeing in many projects these days. Enhancing uh, communication collaboration, second big step. And I'll come back with a couple of examples, quick examples. Um, strengthening institution institutional frameworks. That's super important, particularly for developing countries these days, in terms of actually getting you know, the right actors together, the scientific communities talking uh, to each other, but also to uh, other actors, funders. Um, that's my first step. Fourth is really building capacity and inclusivity. 
And there, there's a lot of exchanges amongst G20 countries. Uh, we indeed often focus on North America and Europe with excellent examples of cooperation, but there's a lot going on right now in, in a number of um, G20 countries that are not OECD members, but also um, South-South cooperation. And the final step is obviously ensuring political will uh, over the long run. And that's, you know, one of the key challenges. But there too, we have some lessons learned from countries that are actually making sure that in their own administrations, some plans, you know, take a long view. So even if you have political processes that change a long, a long, you know, a long time uh, for some time, then you always have some of the key missions going on. So these are really the main steps. And maybe just, you know, a quick example in terms of, you know, building capacity, inclusivity. Uh, there's this program that was born already more than a decade ago on you know, the Global Partnership for Sharks and Rays. So it's it's very specific, um, but then it's known as the the Shark Conservation Conservation Fund. So it supports countries in Asia, Latin America, and Africa to develop and implement national plans of actions uh, for the conservation and management of shark and ray populations. So not only does it involve grants, training, workshops, but it also had concrete impacts in terms of actually protection, setting up of marine protected areas. All this via really capacity building and knowledge transfer. Among scientists, but not only, we've also administrations talking to each other in terms of sharing best practices. And one of the key proposals, uh, as we look at the 3030 initiative, is really to look at the, the deep ocean, you know, below 200 meters, to not forget this part of the ocean. And, and noting that uh, should, should we be able to actually say that, you know, 30% of the deep ocean, uh, is actually protected, that would provide 80% of species partial protection across their range. So that's for sharks and rays. That would be already immensely useful to protect biodiversity because they have key roles to play. So again, there are some practical steps, practical examples that exist beyond the usual suspects, I would say. Um, so global ocean observing of marine biodiversity brings many disciplines together, but I'm quite confident that there are so many things going on in terms of um, ocean health, the importance of monitoring ocean health, that we can actually get some good examples and, and, and active actions really uh, on the way across countries. Thank you, Claire. So perhaps here I'd like to ask Pooja, I mean, we've just heard about the importance of collaboration and getting different actors involved and so on. So. A company like Fugro, who's you you outlined quite well how you've been active in very many different parts of collecting data and so on. Are you actively looking at some of these uh, international perspectives and these needs that have come up and potential policies and collaborations that you can support actively as a global company? You're muted. No, absolutely. Um, we are we are very we're really very active in the space uh, because because of a variety of reasons. I'm happy to touch upon in the course of the conversation, but I think the key to this will really be public private partnerships. Uh, what the private sector can can really bring to the table is is, for instance, scalable technologies. Um, I think we have a lot of uh, we, we have a lot of science out there. We have a lot of uh, methodologies out there. Um, but but to be able to really scale this up to the level where we can start, you know, uh, using it for decision making at a large scale needs investment. It needs a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, participation uh, there from, I think, the private sector as well. Um, I think um, uh, a good example of that would be a project we're doing right now in Italy. Uh, we're actually mapping the entire coastline of Italy. And if you remember the map of Italy, it's a pretty long coastline. Um, we're mapping it entirely uh, for, for seagrass and, and, and we're supporting the government there uh, with, with their coastal programs over a very long, long-term project. Um, and, and we're doing this with a multitude of different technologies, all the way from satellites to, uh, to airplanes, to, to vessels, to, to really uh, um, uh, drones that go underwater. Um, and, and having this combination of different technologies in a scalable way obviously needs that level of, of, of commitment and investment from, from the government involved in this case. Um, and, and seagrass is obviously very important for marine biodiversity as a home for many, many different kinds of species, and apart from being also carbon sinks. The other thing where we uh, we play a role is, is opportunistic data collection. Um, so so uh, we're obviously, uh, what we're actually founding members of the CBA 2030 program, um, and uh, we 
uh, I mean, as you know, if you know anything about the program, which I'm sure many people on the call probably do, uh, it aims to have the entire ocean floor mapped by 2030. Very ambitious. Um, and what we're doing is we are, we, are, we are trying to, essentially, when we're doing projects in faraway locations, we just turn on our sensors on the way and, and, and collect the data um, and, and donate it for, for, for scientific uh, use. Um, and, and I think we've, we've donated about 2.6 million square kilometers uh, of, of data so far, which is uh, yeah, as, uh, bigger than the size of Mexico, if you, if you put it in perspective. Um, and hopefully this is helping enhancing our collective knowledge of the, of, of the ocean and, uh, and, and also managing our resources sustainably. Uh, we talked about goose. Um, um, so um, as of a couple of weeks ago, actually, uh, we, Fibro, actually, uh, represent, uh, myself representing Fibro, we are part of the steering committee uh, of, of Goose, uh, which is, which is, uh, I think, a very, a very uh, progressive step forward to really have uh, private sector involvement also in, in the, in the decision making around the, 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 the Goose uh, uh, endeavors, uh, because really the, the greatest success will happen when you're, when you have that public-private uh, partnership uh, ongoing. Um, and uh, and yeah, uh, the other thing we are really active in, and we are really uh, trying to uh, to really be the leaders in the space in the marine domain, is uh, data sharing initiatives. Um, so we lead the uh, uh, the UN Ocean Decade Corporate Data Group, uh, uh, which is really working towards increasing public access to privately held ocean data. Um, there is a lot of data out there that's just sitting in shelves, um, and 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 you know the more you go out and collect data that also has a carbon footprint associated with it, you're also disturbing marine life when you're collecting that data. So when you acquire once, you want to be using it for as many applications as possible, including biodiversity uh, monitoring and mapping. Um, so um, this sort of an initiative is is actually quite crucial when it comes to uh, both decision making and fostering collaboration. I think among different uh, different entities that hold ocean data. Um, so yeah, this is uh, this is really uh, maybe a snapshot of examples that show the industry's commitment to uh, the system practices um, in this space. Well, it's good to hear that there's so much effort going into this. Um, and you also mentioned at one point the importance of finance. And one thing that I think is important uh, that we have to do as well, I mean, uh, many people involved in this see the, the obvious use of it. And perhaps these are not the people that we really need to, to convince. So if I turn to you, Ralph, um, if we wanted to really make a concrete case for the importance of integrating biological information and observation. You spend a lot of time looking at how observation can be applied and so on. What would you say are some of the important blue economic sectors that we could really benefit and strengthen and give a real advantage to if they had more detailed, more regular operative information? I think you could say it's the entirety of the blue economy um, would benefit from not not necessarily more observations, but better understanding of the benefits that observations can deliver to them. Uh, there are areas where we certainly need more and different observations. There are emerging parts of the ocean economy where we lack quite critical bits of information, including biological information. I'm thinking in terms of initiatives around marine carbon dioxide removal, um, the whole area of how we support the financing components in terms of bonds. Um, so think about ecosystem services, how are we going to monitor and measure those to a sufficient degree of robustness that they can be supporting financial instruments. So it's across the piece. Every area would benefit. Um, I think in the terms of in terms of biological observations, I think we're seeing something of a technological revolution in our capacity to deliver those. But of course, we've got to turn that now into operational services. And that's quite a challenge. Moving from science to operations is always challenging. And it's particularly challenging for the for the for the ocean sector, primarily because of something was mentioned earlier, the lack of visibility. Um, and a lack of recognition of the importance of the oceans and a lack of understanding of the benefits that um, ocean data and information can deliver. That's a really interesting perspective, Ralph, that actually it's not necessarily more, but it's better and better tuned, which suggests that we also need to have a much better dialogue across different groups of stakeholders, whether they're academic, whether they're policy driven or industry driven. I think that's a, a problem for the ocean science community to, to grapple with. 
I'm going to say something perhaps slightly controversial. The ocean science community has never been very good at engaging with policymakers. Mm. Um, it's a bit of a closed community. Um, those of you, and I'm sure many on the call, were who were at the Ocean Decade meeting conference recently, if you took a poll of the participation in that conference, it was almost entirely the science community talking to itself. And of course, that's not the way in which you deliver operational use of ocean data information in practical decision making about really, really important issues. No, I, I thank you for that perspective, Ralph. And I think that there are many people within the scientific community that would struggle to disagree with this. Um, but I think also in a one of the real challenges is to ensure that there is a, a good dialogue going on between the different communities. And I think where one of the big bottlenecks is in terms of enabling this discussion is many scientists and the academics don't know which way to turn and who to speak to and are looking for the right forum to understand what could I contribute? How do I contribute? How do I make sure what I do is actually useful? Um, so I had actually hoped to, to turn things in a different direction, but I'd like to pursue this topic a little bit because I think it's absolutely at the core of making sure that the data you mentioned, Ralph, gets to the right people or that the right data gets to the right people. And so perhaps I would then ask Zoe here, you work for an organization that covers many governments. You have a reach across many, many countries. What are your perspectives and plans for trying to enable a better uh, and a more open conversation between these different stakeholder groups, academia, government, industry, and so on? Thank you, Nicolas. It's a difficult question and one that has multiple answers because there isn't a single forum where these discussions are taking place. And from the point of view of the European Commission, I think that one of the most important things that we are do, we're trying to do is to develop what we call the Ocean Observation Initiative. And the Ocean Observation Initiative aims to bring transparency and collaboration in the way that the European member states are conducting ocean observation, including biological observation, taking uh, an overall view of what is happening in the European level, who is collecting what, for what purpose, uh, with what methodology, when, where, uh, because this is a basic knowledge that we lack. And in some areas, it's creating also a lot of data gaps because sometimes the data exists and we don't have access to it. Sometimes the observation exists and we don't have access to it. And there are areas that are poorly observed and we need to fix this. Uh, the deep sea that Claire uh, mentioned before is one of these areas. It's, an, it's a very well identified gap, but at the same time we have very well recognized gap of non-biological observation in the Black Sea, in the Mediterranean Sea. And I'm now, I'm, I'm focusing in, in Europe for obvious reasons. Uh, but uh, so the Ocean Observation Initiative aims to do this. And this is one platform that I think that in the future, and if we are successful in bringing it forward, it's going to bring a great advantage, not only for the member states of the European Union, but also in providing uh, good practices and a collaboration platform uh, in the global level, which is very important for us. Mm -hmm. And since I'm discussing about the global level and about data and observation, I will move to the work of EMATNET as a forum, also a, a discussion forum for not how we conduct ocean observation, but how we manage the data and how we make this data available for multiple uses and how we implement common standards. And I see in this perspective EMATNET as, um, uh, as a, a, a great uh, ambassador uh, in the global level in order to, to, to make these this standards available and make the sta common standards, the use of common standards an agreement that we need to, to achieve. And a final thing that I think that uh, goes well with what Fabrice said before, and the European Commission and the Union is doing and supporting, is the development of technology and innovation that will allow biological observation to happen uh, in a more uh, economic manner. We need this. We need 
uh, innovation and technology that will allow us to have biological ob observation with less cost and faster. Uh, and this is, I think, areas that the intervention of uh, the commission work and, and funding can support. Thank you, Zoe. Fabrice, you want to react? Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, actually, this is very interesting. And, and then what I was, uh, I mean, to maybe to provide a, a very concrete example, and like I, I agree that moving to science to something that is a product that is operational and it, it takes time, but and sometimes there are new approaches, new technologies coming in. Like I'm, 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 I have in mind that e environmental DNA, for instance, and that is completely changing the game of biological observation or biodiversity monitoring and everything. And there, I mean, you see there is some some time lag. It takes time, some inertia to to, to translate that technology that is like ready and that we need indeed some private money now to 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 move up scale and to scale it up to something more operational. And we need support for the uh, from the institutions, the uh, European Commission, everything. And and as other scientists, I feel like uh, okay, we are there. What what we we need to 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 scale it up, and then that can be very useful for a lot of economy for the blue uh, economy. And, and then, yeah, and then we need like, uh, there is sometimes you need the money right now, but like a big amount of money right now if, to move forward. Otherwise it's gonna take another 10 years. And then, you know, that's that's so uh, kind of um, frustrating in a way as a scientist when you see that it's almost there. And what we need is that this shot that that, that translates it to, into something that is really operational. And uh, yeah, so it's just, yeah, why right an example. So if you'd like to respond, please, before we move on. It's it's not exactly a response, but it's a big, going back to your basic question at the moment. I think that it's the discussion of the forum for fora that we make this science policy interface uh, is very interesting because uh, as the climate is changing, the political climate is changing in Europe, scientists and, and decision makers and stakeholders need to uh, re, re, reshape the narrative that we use when we speak about ocean observation. There is a tendency, uh, and I am part of this tendency as well, to focus on, um, on issues that sometimes are difficult for policymakers to digest and may not seem to be a, a clear priority. But when we speak, we need to make more clear that when we speak about ocean and marine sustainability and the need of knowledge and biological observation, we speak about the sustainability of our economies and our societies. And we, make to, we need to reinforce this link in the most appropriate way and make it super clear that those issues are, are fundamentally connected and they, uh, the prosperity of our economies the, the, and the development of a blue economy is absolutely uh, related to this kind of knowledge and observation and the way that this is managed in, in the European and the global level. Thank you, Zoe. So I think this is uh, the point where we really need to have to ask Natalie for, uh, to come in here. I mean, we've now touched extensively on finance. We've heard many times how important this component is. And of course, I mean, in terms of observation and in terms of science, very much, we, very look, we often look at funding agencies and governments and so on that are financing this. What are the options then for bringing alternative funding in that aren't just science-based or government-based? Do you see now with all these new bonds that have been introduced or in general in terms of investment, do you see a growing interest in this topic or an interest to invest in new technology or so on and so forth? How do things look from your perspective in terms of investment and finance? Yes, uh, of course. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's very essential if you, you want to um, mobilize sufficient finance to show what does the finance do? You know, what impacts does the finance have on the real economy, on the ecosystems where it wants to be active? Um, there are a lot of new instruments that I've talked about, and a lot of new guidances that, that, that I've talked about to really guide blue bonds, to guide blue loans, to guide venture capital lists coming in. But in the end, we need to show that that money that's there really has an impact on 
what we want to achieve, which is um, improving the state of the oceans, improving the state of the biodiversity in the oceans. So um, there are many, many uh, angles from which I could <laughs> uh, approach your questions, which, which is a broad question, but uh, I think we also have to look at what's going on in the reporting environment. I mean, uh, we have now the um, uh, European Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which is a big, big driver. Uh, uh, data, they asking for data basically uh, as companies, big companies, listed companies, and also smaller companies uh, need to uh, start reporting uh, from next year on the smaller companies a little bit later in 2027-8. But from next year on, the big listed companies in the European Union need to report according to the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, next to its financial reporting, of course. And they need to report on pollution, on water, on marine resources, on their impact on biodiversity and ecosystems, uh, looking directly at the impact driver of biodiversity loss. So these companies need to really show and lay open their impact uh, that they have on, 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 on the biodiversity and the oceans. And um, uh, this, is gonna, this is a big challenge uh, for many companies, but it's also a big opportunity you know, to reach out to the scientific community to get the data they need to report. And uh, because the data is being collected in, the, in a single European data access point that this company reports, the data will be audited. It will be uh, for a limited audit required. So you have audited centrally available data on a European access point where um, you know, financial decision makers uh, that also asset managers that want to look for companies that have a reduced impact on biodiversity really can um, plow to the data to find the best uh, match for, for their fund, for their uh, product. So we have a, a vast uh, 40,000 companies starting to report from next year on in the European Union on biodiversity data. So this is new. This is absolutely new. There is a vast body of information that we land into the realm also of the financial sector. And we want this information to be accurate. And we want this information to be science-based. So I think uh, what has been said also previously, we need a much, much closer collaboration between the different actors because there is a... Uh, the UNFCCC um, and the IPCC, the IPCC six assessment report really clearly says we have enough finance out there to solve our challenges, but we have to redirect it to the right uh, to the to the right um, uh, where, where it's really needed. So, and this redirection requires transparency. The corporate sustainability reporting directive is a form of transparency, uh, but it's not only transparency; it's also a form of strategy that companies have to report, they see their baseline, what is their uh, impact now, and they start about thinking, so how can I improve my impact? So it's going to be also flow into the strategic decisions of, of company mm -hmm. on how to reduce the footprint, the biodiversity footprint. And for that, uh, you know, companies need to know when, I, when they do a new investment, they need to be able to see the cost benefits, you know, they need to deliver a robust cost benefit analysis before they make serious investments. And here for a good cost benefit analysis, we need much more granular information on, on, uh, on, on biodiversity uh, and their drivers. Um, and I see a lot of connections uh, between all the actors that are in, in the panel here today, uh, also to bring that, that information up to the finance sector where because without financing, you don't have the action that we need to require to fulfill our um, global biodiversity framework, the, 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 the Paris Agreement. And it's about collaboration and getting the right and credible data out because mm -hmm. the financial regulators, uh, they look at, at it very closely now. <laughs> so, yeah. That's a really interesting perspective because I certainly <laughs> wouldn't have thought of it in those terms of people were looking at where is sound investment in the future. So thank you for that. And mm -hmm. I see Ralph wants to contribute, please. I think all of this really comes back to the regulatory framework in which all these activities take place. Uh, and we've seen all the scandals around um, selling carbon credits and the lack of a regulatory framework for that. Once you have a good regulatory framework, you'll drive the need for good quality information. And without that, 
people will make decisions, they will make financial commitments in a poor way because there's nothing actually driving mm. the quality of what they're doing. So this really comes down to science and the regulatory policy making community working together to set appropriate regulatory frameworks in all of these areas of the ocean economy that are effective in driving the outcomes we're looking for. It seems to me then that this goes right back to what we were saying earlier about the importance of having that exchange of information and getting different stakeholders and to interact with one another to make it crystal clear what things, and this was going to be one of my questions as well around this was if we have all these regulatory frameworks and we're asking companies to do so, I'm not sure that there is a, a rigid set of regulations to report towards or accepted indicators, which means that we could have a lot of information gathered in many different ways without an agreement on how it's collected and what the regulatory framework needs to know. Please, Ralph. I think, it, I think it's getting all of the different stakeholders together. That's one part of the challenge. The other part of the challenge is getting them to speak in a common language or at least understand each other's <laughs> language. You put the science community alongside a community of policymakers, quite often they won't understand what each side is actually saying because each side has their own jargon. Mm -hmm. um, so we need more people that can span that divide mm -hmm. and can communicate effectively between those two groups rather than sitting in their silos. And the science community is very bad at sitting in its silos and not stepping outside and gaining the knowledge to be able to communicate effectively with the people that they're trying to influence. No, I would very much agree with that. Um, so perhaps I would like to ask you, Claire, now at this point. So we've heard many different initiatives and we've heard the needs for interaction with many different stakeholders. In the sort of discussions you're involved with and the projections that you're trying to do at the OECD and so on, do you see these sort of effective conversations already happening in certain places or do you see certain regions being far more advanced than others and being truly exemplary for how you could move forward on this? Um, so I'm not going to pick winners and losers <laughs> <laughs> at, this, at this stage, uh, but, but thanks for the question. However, uh, indeed, I see a lot of uh, progress, but also uh, we need to be very careful. And I think Ralf made a very good point about you know the regulatory framework and the need for dialogue. Is you know how do we ensure that you know data on marine biodiversity is, is actually pertinent? Um, we heard also from Natalie this importance of the finance community coming in. Um, so maybe three main points, you know, the marine data, and that links directly to your question, uh, Nicolas. You know, we need to highlight relevance, obviously, of the marine data, um, showing the direct and indirect impacts of marine biodiversity on on different actors' interests. You know, the economic benefits they get from it, uh, the ecosystem services, uh, or indeed responding to regulatory regulatory requirements. We did a survey um, in the UK not very long ago um, on different ocean data repositories. And there we found uh, that many of the users of this public marine data were actually offshore wind um, yeah, industry players mm. that need data, not only again on you know oceanographic data, they need biodiversity data to actually make sure that they respect um, the legal, the regulatory requirements that they have as part of their licensing uh, regime. So that means, you know, Regulations push for more more uses here of biodiversity data. So that's one important aspect, relevance. The other one is demonstrate value. And there, uh, Ralph has great experience with NOAA. And, and again, I'm not picking winners and losers, but I believe the US has done great work in terms of actually indeed demonstrating how ocean data in general is actually contributing to many new economic activities. So show the practical benefits of using accurate biodiversity data um, for risk management, even uh, enhancing corporate social responsibility, as mentioned by Natalie, that helps. So relevance, value, and of course, the famous dialogue um, in terms of making sure that uh, you know the concerns, the priorities of different actors are taken into account and you know how biodiversity can address these issues. I think these are three elements that are very important and uh, that help you actually get a sense of who's really, I would say, getting the right policies in place. 
um, in terms of marine uh, biodiversity data. And I see a reaction. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Claire. Please, Fabrice. Yeah, that makes me think about, I mean, you know, uh, I think this is very important as well because, they, you know, sometimes the reg regulatory framework and, and, and um, isn't, uh, to me, um, I would say, uh, in phase with what we can provide, actually, or we can offer uh, as a scientist. Uh, and sometimes uh, these, these uh, indicators or like uh, data that are required by the regul regulatory framework is not actually um accurate or is not uh, uh um, is not good enough at that stage and we could provide more if we had this opportunity and that's why i, I do believe that this dialogue is very important that we we manage to, to have a closer dialogue between uh, uh industry and politics and science because we are developing stuff that we don't want to keep for us actually but we would like to offer to uh, to the to the community mm -hmm. and Well, please, Claire, yeah. react. Yes. Yeah, May I react yeah. to the reaction? Please. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I think you're making a, an excellent point here, uh, and that that goes hand in hand with you know having the right stakeholders talk uh, to each other. Because uh, even at the OECD, you know, we look for new types of indicators, but we need to align with science. You know, you don't you, often we just need one data point, but that doesn't give you all the information that's collected when you look at biodiversity, obviously. So indeed, there are needs, of course, for, for exchanges. And maybe just one quick mention of um, blue bonds um, and blue carbon sequest sequestration. There are a number of papers that just came out over the past few months that show that indeed uh, many different ecosystems may not actually you know, sequest as much carbon as what we thought. This is so important for us you know, in the policy circles to know. We need to make sure that there's not, uh, you know, a blue bubble growing here. We need to actually make sure that the best science, the latest science is always taken into account, even in financial instruments. That's very, very important, I believe. And I'll stop here. Yeah, can I just finish my second point? And then, uh, because I think it's very important is going towards what you were saying, actually. And that's something that's been mentioned before, is that We've been working on silos so much, even in the within the scientific community, you know, because oceanographers and, and marine biologists or biological oceanographers, and that and that's something we should stop definitely. And then we should make, I mean, make sure that there is this dialogue that's that's uh, happening. And and we, we I mean, I, I, there are a few projects I'm involved in uh, on the national, on the European level. I mean, I mean, Nicolas knows Marco Bodo project, for instance, on the European level. We're trying to do indeed. To, to to think about and try to build indicators um, integrating like uh, I would say classical uh, ocean observations data and uh, new uh, marine uh, biodiversity data and using automated imaging in situ imaging using environmental DNA and and, and also we're trying what we're trying to do is to include as well some some um, uh, um, economic um, ecosystem services and, and societal data like uh, ecosystem use, and recreative usage and aqu aquaculture. So there is this kind of sort of like a so so social ecosystem uh, approach to the uh, observation. So that's what we are trying to do as well. And uh, and I think it's important to do. Sorry, I'm done. Thanks. Thank you, Fabrice. Ralph, please. To pick up on Fabrice's point about um, regulation sometimes freezing the adoption of um, new approaches to collecting data is a big challenge. That's exactly what tends to happen. You set a regulation and it stays, it locks in the way in which something is measured and monitored. So we've got to find a way of working with policymakers to ensure that there's evolution of regulatory mechanisms so that they do have the capacity to adopt new technologies when those new technologies can make them more effective rather than freezing out the new technologies because there's an established way of doing things and that's the only way you do it. Some, and it says, again, that's about dialogue. It's about how do we get the people that draft policy, draft regulations working alongside the communities, not just the scientists, the technologists as well, and understanding the art of the possible Equally, as a challenge the other way around, making sure your regulatory framework doesn't ask for something you can't monitor yet. 
And we've seen plenty of examples of that where regulations are set, but we lack the capacity to actually understand whether they're being effective. And, and of course, the most difficult area of all to be able to effectively police them and make sure that whatever the regulation is trying to enforce actually is enforced. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, Pooja, you wanted to contribute as well, please. You're muted. Yeah, I, this, is, this is a very, very interesting discussion because there's so many different angles to put to, 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 to balance here. I mean, there's the regulation, there's the requirements of data. Of course, we all want the best possible data over the entire seabed or the entire ocean, but that's going to cost. Um, and that, that leads to, 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 to linked problems. You've got technological barriers because if you want to deploy and maintain advanced ocean observation te technologies, it is expensive and it can be logistically challenging and, and it can actually have quite a large carbon footprint as well, um, especially because of the harsh marine environment. And if you don't use the right technology, you might just get bad quality data. So maybe sometimes bad data is even worse than no data. Um, so, so, and, and that contributes to the other problem of the data standardization. You know, the fact that there is a lack of standardization is partly because we are maybe not using the right method of data collection with the right scope, or maybe we're duplicating data collection a lot in certain parts of the world and ignoring certain other parts of the world. And I'm thinking global, not global south here. Um, and, and, and also the, uh, the, the, the expertise gaps as well, because a lot of this is also skill. I mean, you can have all the scalable technologies in the world, but if you don't have the expertise in, in actually getting the information, um, and, and again, I'm thinking Global South here, uh, where, uh, I mean, uh, the Global South, especially you think of small island nations, for instance, they are really at the forefront of where climate change is, is, is affecting them the most. Um, and they may not have the, the, either the expertise or the equipment or the funding to really support this uh, ocean observation driven decision making. Um, so uh, regulations, yes, very important, I think. Um, but I think there's also that um, that maybe disparity in focus between the global north and the global south that should also be addressed in these uh, in these discussions. I think this is a really important point about the disparities because if you want to have a consistent observation of the ocean and understanding, it needs to be along rules that everyone can participate in. I think this is really important and it's certainly something we've become quite conscious of in the academic community as well is scalability of technology and cost of technology. Um, but please, Zoe, you wanted to contribute too. I wanted to go back to the flexible legislation <laughs> Flexible and legislation are not very commonly used in the same phrase, and there is a reason for that. And I, I, I in theory, I agree very much with Ralph. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, thinking about the legislative process that includes, the, at least the processes that are including uh, biological observation and uh, the methods of biological observation. I'm wondering how we can add this flexibility because uh, the, the legislative process is a very complex process that most of the times includes experts in specific parts of it and not in the whole of it. And it's a quite challenging task to, to ask to make a legislation flexible because the more flexible you make it, the more difficult it is to implement it. Um, Maybe methodologies like this shouldn't be part of legislation at all and should be part of implementing acts that are easier to, to, to exchange as well. But it's a very interesting discussion and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really wondering how we could address it better in the level of the European Commission because it's coming up and again. Uh, and to, to feed in what Pooja said, there are discrepancies even... In, in, in between the member states in the way that uh, observation is happening. And then this reflects very much uh, into, the global, uh, and into the global domain and how we, we can develop capacities and, uh, and share them. Thank you, Zui. And perhaps on that, I would... Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I wanted to add just that we should, I think that the key to all of the above is to, to connect the, the need for observing with, with specific actions, uh, with, with, with what we need it for, with what is necessary for, why the governments 
should be interested in this and we should probably it's it's not a new idea it has been said many times but we should use uh, meteorological observations as an example nobody doubts the fact that we need meteorological observations nobody doubts the fact that we need to pay for meteorological observations mm. there was a process that developed towards this and maybe we should copy it Thank you, Zoe. Uh, I agree very much with that point as well. Um, and so, Natalie, please, you wanted to react here. Yes, I, I wanted to come in um, on, on, on two points also that uh, Porja has mentioned over the course of the discussion. Uh, the late one is a capacity gap between the south and the north, uh, that you don't have enough skilled Skilled, um, uh, skilled people to operate uh, complex uh, remote sensing or satellite data and, 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 and get it into the right fi financing frameworks. And I think that's, that's a, a serious issue. And uh, we have at the, uh, on the other side, uh, you know, I'm working a lot with international climate finance budgets. These are the budgets, the 100 billion of the, of the Paris Agreement uh, of, of money that has to go from developed countries to developing countries and we think a lot about how to uh, f with some donors on how to uh, design uh, where to which activities it could go and I think part of the part of this budget could be used you know to upskill or to skill people in this house to be able to uh, operate the new technologies that we have for data um, data collection, data management, uh, in order to fulfill not only the Paris Agreement goals, but also the, the global biodiversity framework. So this uh, pool of public money is often called also blended, <laughs> blended finance, how to use this public money in blended finance transactions, really to first look at what are the risks of such a transaction, to how can we manage the environmental and social risk and the biodiversity risk, but also what are the impacts of such transactions and how can we really uh, monitor on the ground. We had, uh, I think now two weeks ago, uh, World Bank released the, the coral bond uh, with Indonesia, uh, a big announcement. And uh, a part of this bond really also included uh, as, as an impact metric, the coral reef, fish biomass, a live coral cover. I mean, for these, for these uh, indicators, we need real serious data <laughs> for, in order for the private sector to be able to buy to buy that bond. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's a lot of interactions. Um, uh, we could continue discussing a lot more. And uh, one last point uh, uh, I want to touch upon is what Puja has said even be previous, uh, at the beginning of the discussion also about uh, data sharing. Uh, I also listen in in a lot of forums about the energy transition, you know, the energy and, and the role of the ocean economy that can play in the energy transition. We have a large off offshore wind. Uh, we need to make uh, uh, assessments of the risk before putting up such an <laughs> offshore wind uh, uh, plant. Uh, we have floating solar panels on the water big scale. So we, we, we are talking now big scale and not small scale because the transition has to happen so fast. But what does it mean? We don't have experience in assessing, uh, a good experience in assessing environmental impacts of big scale ocean economy infrastructure. And here really comes uh, the developers are now starting to join forces in big projects. And it's not one developer doing small projects, but developers starting to join uh, forces in big infrastructure, uh, ocean-based infrastructure projects. And uh, here again, they need to share data. And they're looking at the insurance sector, the reinsurance sector, uh, in, in order to, to, to uh, be, help them uh, share this data because the insurance sector is is uh, sitting on a number of good data and, and is probably looking to the science community to get that data. So I think that point from Poja was very well made about data sharing is super important, but not only, uh, but also look towards the project developers, the insurance sector and, and, and get it all together. Indeed, I think this is really important and I'd like Poja to, to respond to that and can maybe also say a bit more about what can be done about getting these data from companies and insurers and so on into a common platform or more accessible. Please, Pooja. No, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for, for raising that, Matthew. I think, I think it's a very valuable point. Um, we talked about 
I mean, the whole uh, the whole discussion around you know climate change and uh, think about uh, uh, you know activities like offshore wind or wave and tidal energy or NCDR, they really have a potential to contribute. I think twenty one percent or so uh, to the emissions reductions that are actually required by twenty fifty if we want to limit ourselves to one point five degrees. Uh, we were actually uh, in a, uh, together with the Economist Impact. We did a study uh, uh, late last year, I think, um, and we uh, I think that the conclusions to that study were um, something like. 52 billion is the amount of the value of uh, marine-based climate change economy. Um, and about two percent of that actually relies on ocean observation data today. By 2030, you're looking at a figure of about 252 billion, this, this value of the, 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 you know, the marine climate change-based economy. And up to 100% of that will be reliant on ocean observation data. So it's absolutely critical that we get the right data in place. Uh, we're already doing a lot of work with offshore wind, to your point, uh, Natalie. We're doing a lot of work around character characterizing very large areas uh, uh, with them, also from a biodiversity perspective, so really helping them to uh, to meet their biodiversity net gain targets. Um, but it is a very good point. In the end, data sharing can only work if the private sector is incentivized to do so. Um, so maybe what I could do is, is give you a, a, a bit of a, a, you know, a, a thinking from our side as Kugro as to why we're doing this. Um, I mean, yes, um, this is very much in line with our, our vision. Um, so we, we, uh, we, we use geodata to create a safe and livable world. Um, that's our vision, and this is very much in line with it. So that's, that's a no-brainer. Uh, but, but on the other side, what we, what we also see is, uh, for us, it helps us enhance our market position. So by making our data available, we actually position ourselves as a leader in the space. Uh, it, it demonstrates our commitment to transparency, to innovation, to collaboration. Um, and this, of course, enhances our reputation as well. And we're able to attract a lot more uh, uh, partnerships and, and, and new clients, which are really key to, to that collaborative, uh, uh, you know, what, what we talked about earlier. This can only work if, if we can build partnerships. Um, and for us, it's also about driving innovation and research. So again, I, I told you earlier about scalable technologies. That's something we are heavily focused on investing in. Um, and if you if you have open data out there, you're actually driving innovation by enabling researchers, developers, and other stakeholders to really create these new applications and solutions, which may be based off our data, but also the data of the whole community. Um, so this can lead to advancements uh, in, in both the observation methodologies, but also the, the data analytics and the AI and whatever else you need to, uh, to, to, be, to be able to get information from these vast amounts of data. Um, and ultimately, that benefits us because it integrates back to our own services as a company. Um, and then we talked earlier about regulatory compliance and, and, and funding. Um, so making this data available really helps us comply with these regulatory uh, requirements uh, and actually qualify in many cases for public funding and grants. Uh, because often governments and international organizations, they, they support projects that actually emphasize data sharing and collaboration. So that's obviously a financial incentive for us as well. Um, we talked about partnerships, but also the, the corporate social responsibility part, the CSR. I think you mentioned that as well, uh, Natalie. Um, so, uh, you know, the fact that we have to report on all of this, it, it, this is one of the uh, one of the things we do report out on as well. So it, it, the contribution to global efforts to fight, fight climate change and, and, you know, promote marine conservation, um, this this really fulfills our, our both our, our reporting, but also ethical obligations to contribute back to society. And maybe the last point I'd like to say here is market expansion. Um, so traditionally, we've had a few focus markets, but by investing in the scalable technology and sharing data, we can really create new business opportunities by identifying emerging market segments and, and, and the needs of these market uh, segments as well. Um, so by just putting data out there, you can you learn so much about, you know, where is that demand for data? What kind of data is required? What are the standards? How should we be, you know, collecting data in the future to be to make to make the most impact? So that really helps us as well as a company to grow and 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 and, and you know contribute in this space. So in the end, we see ourselves as being so reliant on the ocean and the and the, and the blue economy um, as responsible stewards of the ocean and 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 sort of give back that way by uh, by ensuring that it it remains a um, yeah, a sustainable playing ground for all different parties, private, public sector, everybody. Thank you very much. And uh, so we're quickly running out of time, but I'd like Claire to uh, to respond to this since she's been waiting patiently. Please, Claire. I'm always patient, <laughs> but thanks very much, Nicolas. Uh, no, I just wanted to rebound on, on, on what was just said in terms of, you know, having all this infrastructure, 
um, set up in the ocean. So we have this project going on right now on the, uh, the OECD on the ocean economy in 2050. And we see indeed incredible growth in terms of you know, projects, number of projects for renewable energy to actually boosted by uh, the energy transition. But of course, uh, also marine aquaculture, uh, gigantic, I would say, uh, projects that may have impact definitely uh, on higher coastal zones uh, like never before. So indeed, looking at the many developments that we're seeing in the ocean economy today, we also see in parallel this very strong demand that will come in, particularly in countries that have set up the right regulatory frameworks for um, more data. They, they will need more data to make sure that there's compliance over, over time. So uh, looking ahead, uh, I think the, I think there will be a, a number of strong messages, hopefully fueling into the the next UN Ocean Conference uh, that's coming next June. Uh, so I just wanted just to flag this particular work that we're doing, this uh, foresight work. Thank you, Claire, and indeed thank you to all of you because uh, this is I feel like we could go on for another hour. This has been really really interesting and lots of new perspective and insights for me as well. So. Um, we do have a Q&A session coming up quite shortly, but I, I would like to give all of you panelists an opportunity to just provide your major takeaway message from, from this discussion. Um, and so maybe we'll go backwards this time and then so I could give Claire a, a chance to breathe as well. So we, we can start with Natalie if you want to oh. just provide your takeaway message. <laughs> well, not prepared to go first, but... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's it's uh, my takeaway message is, you know, real scientific data are the backbone of good finance, you know, on, of good finance first from a risk management perspective of reducing the risks of the financial instruments of uh, having a good uh, monitoring of the real impacts for the eco ecosystems, but also to avoid greenwashing risks. So, you know, uh, it's a big, big topic and we didn't touch upon it uh, here today because the time we run out, but this is this is part also of, of this integrity of, of the whole sustainable financing market. So we need you. Thank you very much, Natalie. And indeed, greenwashing is something that would have been great to cover today as well. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, many topics. Okay, so um, then we can go on to Ralph, please. I think what we need to make all of this happen is much, much better visibility of the benefits of ocean data and information um, and breaking out of this out of sight, out of mind challenge. And then we need to make sure that operational oceanography is in a sufficiently robust institutional framework at a global level. We've had endless debates in the past about the difference between meteorology and oceanography in this regard. Um, one has its base in a mandated framework for cooperation internationally, and one has its basis in um, a, a voluntary system, which is primarily science driven. And until we break that, we will never get to the point of having a proper, robust operational capacity in the oceans. Thank you very much, Ralph and Fabrice. Yeah. So yeah. Well, uh, maybe to wrap up. I mean, uh, uh, you know, we we are aware that the biodiversity observation is indeed challenging, and that because of the nature of the data itself. You know, like it's not physics, not, we are not actually measuring biodiversity, we are acquiring data, and then it, it's a whole process to, to get that. And uh, but uh, and, and also, maybe what I can bring as an academic is that most of the diversity is again microscopic. I mean, we, we can monitor calls, uh, waves, sharks. I mean, this is not what this is not marine biodiversity, basically. Uh, I know it's easy to, to, to talk to the, to the people using these examples, but if we want to be effective and actually monitor the ecosystem health, and, and, uh, and this is not what we should look at, or not only at least. And, and then we do have tools now to look at, at uh, the scientists. I mean, I've been developing tools, you know, using to eDNA imaging to, to look at all this, I mean, the entire marine biodiversity, and we should definitely take that into account in the future of marine biodiversity. I think this is important. So we have like not this 
uh, observation in silos, but no, like integrating uh, different kinds of data, different parameters together to answer very specific questions for agriculture, for whatever the, and I think this is key that we, we, we managed to have this more like holistic perspective on, on the uh, marine biodiversity observation, yeah. And obviously to do that, we do need sustained funding and that, that's some stuff we discussed already, uh, observations in what uh, time and then sustained, sustainable funding, yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Fabrice. And Fuja? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think um, I think the world in 2050 could could really be very different from, from the world today if we if we don't act, right? We we face a sharp reality of biodiversity loss. Um, when you think of coral bleaching, you think of actually conflicts around dwindling fish stocks. I think they call it the fish wars that are apparently uh, going to come. Um, so without accessible ocean observation data, we we will we will be quite limited in how we can uh, actually tackle these kind of uh, these kind of issues. So we've talked about data standards. Standardization. I think that's really crucial. We need to um, we need to acquire the right data for the right problem, um, and we need to make sure we have the right metrics in place to be able to uh, be efficient about this. With climate, it's easy. Everything is a CO2 equivalent. That's great. One metric, and that's it. Um, with biodiversity, it's way more complex than that. We're talking about life. We're talking about life in all of its complexities and and and, and layers, which makes life so beautiful. Um, it's it's being able to capture all of that in simple metrics that can be understood by policymakers, by the people making those regulations. How do you simplify the complex? I think that's going to be a key uh, a key a thing to focus on in the, in the coming uh, in the coming years. And then we all talk about open data. Along with openness comes security issues. That's something we need to be focusing on as well. Uh, data sharing is great, but we need to establish robust security measures to make sure that the data doesn't fall into the wrong hands for the wrong purposes, which is also a risk. Um, and then we need, yeah, we need to have that continuous, you know, partnership thinking, that continuous engagement and co-design with with all the stakeholders on the table to uh, to really make sure that any data meets the needs that the people is targeted towards. Um, and then, of course, the inevitable question of investment, really investment in technology, investment in training, that will be key um, to 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 really um, ensure that the data that is that is collected is used in the most appropriate way. And interpreted and, and a high quality that can be reused for multiple applications. Um, so yeah, we just uh, we just like to urge all of the stakeholders, whether it's government, whether it's private companies, please invest, uh, please support public private partnerships, please open your um, your uh, your safes and, and 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 donate data because really together is where we can uh, we can make a difference. Thank you very much, Pooja and Zoe, please. I think that many solutions uh, that have been in the in the issues that have been discussed or many ways forward, if not solutions, because solutions is very de deterministic, uh, will come from the applications of new technologies and making data more understandable and making knowledge more available for the appropriate people and explaining why is it important to invest. Uh, uh, will become easier with the application of digital technologies and uh, complex visualizations that come from instance from initiatives as the European Digital Twin Ocean and the Digital Twin Oceans in general and the framework of the United Nations and the Ocean Decade. And at the same time, to cover a little bit what Rolf said regarding institutional frameworks, I think that this is a remarkable opportunity coming up to take advantage of the development of initiatives as the Intergovernmental Panel for Ocean Sustainability, IPOS, that is being currently developed and can provide uh, this kind of um, international weight that we were waiting for ocean observation to get, and particularly for biological observations that are more challenging and that we need to invest more to cover gaps. Thank you, Zoe. And finally, please, Claire. Thanks, Nicolas. So I believe, you know, to move beyond preaching to the choir, that's something that came back again and again, uh, and indeed develop operational systems that are funded sustainably beyond ad hoc grants. Uh, there's still some homework to be done, I believe, um, to demonstrate different types of biodiversity data, relevance, value, and of course, engage in dialogues. And this is definitely not a one size fits all process. You know, as Fabrice just reminded us, um, you know, there's a wide diversity of biodiversity data from EDNS samples to ocean column monitoring using satellite data also, 
So they call for different economic models to allow data collection analysis and application in decision-making. They're all a bit different. It's not just one big bunch of biodiversity data. So the objective is, of course, to make all this as sustainable as possible over time. And again, some homework to be done. Thank you very much, Claire, and thank you to all of you for your rich uh, contributions. So we would like to take about 10 minutes to answer some questions from the audience. So I will hand over to Alice, who will manage this process and who's been uh, trolling through all the questions that have come up and the most upvoted ones. So uh, Alice, please go ahead and I'll come back for the concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicolas. So we had several questions from the audience and uh, some were already answered through uh, the discussion because they were posted earlier. So we try to pick up the ones that maybe uh, needed still uh, some uh, clarifications. There is an interesting one that is regarding the political strategies and frameworks and um, is the following. Why the ocean appears in the draft of many political strategies and then it is forgotten along the way? And when it does stay, then implementations at the local national level do not happen or happen in a minor way with very few useful impact. How we can change this? To give more um, a perspective, I think the audience uh, is familiar with uh, an example in our domain that is uh, marine protected areas. Uh, there is uh, strategies to protect 30% of the, of the national waters and there are many protected areas are put in place, but most of them, for example, they're not functional because of several reasons. Um, the audience also worries, and this is an, uh, another question, about uh, in perspective what will happen with, um, with the deep oceans uh, usage and exploration is going to be a, a very critical subject and um, it's linked to how these processes from political uh, strategies drafting to actual local national implementation works. How can we be sure that um, these, uh, um, these strategies, these objectives will be actually implemented at the local level in an effective, effective way? Is there anyone from the panel that would like to answer this question? <clears throat> it's a very tough one, I know. Uh, Claire, please go ahead. Maybe just one one element in terms of the deep sea and 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 the current discussions uh, on the high seas. You know, there's the BNG the BNG process going on right now with the High Seas Agreement. So it's not a treaty, it's an agreement that comes on top of the current legal framework. And that will actually provide, uh, indeed, for the first time, a legal, um, I would say, yeah, existence of for the High Seas with protections that should be then uh, 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 pro provided, at least in legal text. But then that links back to the question in terms of how countries will actually indeed take into take this into account. We're talking about the high seas. Countries can do whatever they want in their exclusive economic zones, including in the deep sea. So that's, I think, an important matter to remember. The BBNG process and everything else is really about the high seas, about national regulations, local implementation. That's really up to the countries themselves. If they want to be a good steward of the ocean or not, um, I think that's an important factor. Countries can do whatever they want in their own um, EEZ. That's something to remember. But where we see some nice progress is that indeed, thanks to processes like you know the UN Ocean Conference, of course, a lot of the work going on thanks to the European Commission in European waters, there's some sort of positive synergies across countries to actually be better stewards. But at the end of the day, countries decide what they want to do. Thank you, Claire. Zoe, would you have something to uh, add? No, I think Claire covered very well uh, the situation. Uh, it's a very difficult subject and the Commission has um, a clear view on it, but it's a part of an international discussion that it's going to be very challenging in the years to come. Natalie, please go ahead. 
Yeah, so I want to quickly come in on, on, on the first part of the question about MPAs. You know, we uh, we have seen a, a number of financing structures around uh, getting more uh, MPAs financed, and uh, some of them have uh, evolved around the debt for nature swaps. Um, where um, part of the part of the deal, uh, where an underlying blue bond. Well, speaking now for an example from the Belize that for nature swap was a part of the deal of the blue bond was that part of the use of proceeds of the blue bond go to a dedicated facility that uh, really finances activities on the ground with the communities. So uh, you have elements like that in the financing structures that involve really uh, money getting down, drilling down to the communities who are in the end of, in the end, those who guarantee a successful marine protected area because they are affected by, by marine protection uh, and need to be front and center of all the initiatives that we're talking about, about reaching the 30 by 30 goals of marine protected area by 2030, so in six years. We need to involve communities, NGOs, and getting also the money from the big transactions down to them. So there are uh, there are really thoughts about that in in in, in the larger transactions. Um, and um, um, yeah, just just to mention, uh, I had something else on my mind, but that slipped me now. But just to mention that it, it's factored in, but it's difficult, but it needs to be. Uh, it needs to be in there to ensure successful management of marine protected areas over time that communities and NGOs help in that respect. Thank you very much, Natalie. We have another question that was very popular and is still uh, regarding the regulatory frameworks. I think, uh, Ralph, you can help us uh, in this one. What regulatory frameworks can integrate biodiversity, climate and pollution to prevent a siloed approach to the tripod planetary crisis? Good question. I don't think I'm the best person to answer that one. <laughs> Or does this one even exist? Uh, this, was, this would be my question, yeah. actually. <laughs> or if we should create one, uh, how this could be? Could also be the following question. Zoe, please go ahead. Ah, we, we should first, re regulatory frameworks are not as simple as they sound. Uh, and international agreements are not the same as regulatory framework. So um, I, we, we should make these distinctions because the international agreements are not binding, where usually regulatory frameworks are. Uh, so uh, this is a difficult question to answer from this perspective. Uh, from I would say that the effort that is done in the level of the European Union is that most legislation that is being implemented regarding the marine environment takes a holistic approach that combines uh, uh, biodiversity uh, with climate change and other challenges currently. Uh, the way that this legislation is in the end implemented is a very different discussion because there is a pick, pick and choose element sometimes in the implementation uh, of, of legislation, but the I, I think that if you if you look, look on the way that, for instance, marine strategy framework is implemented, or the way the MSP directive is implemented, they have in in their core the holistic approach that covers different um, uh, different elements that are currently dealing with existential uh, changes and uh, challenges that we are facing. Uh, I think that we shouldn't strive to create more legislation in this regard, but see how we can optimize what we already have uh, and focus, for instance, in other kind of legislation that can support actions as coordination of ocean observation for Thank every you. use. Thank you very much, Zoe. It was very clear your answer. I think the audience will be happy about that. Um, we have another question. I think it's going to be the last one because after we're going to run out of time. 
Um, audience is asking more specification about what are the primary sectors or industries that constitute the blue economy and how do they contribute to sustainable development? How can countries balance economic growth with environmental conservation in maritime industries like fishing and tourism? Claire, do you want to start to open the floor for this answer? So um, I'm, I'm in charge of a unit that actually specializes in measuring the ocean economy. <laughs> so we do have a blueprint on measuring the ocean economy that provides a list of different activities um, that actually are part of the ocean economy in general. So, so far, um, as part of the recent work that we have done uh, in the OECD monitor, uh, for the ocean economy, the OECD Ocean Economy Monitor, we have actually 20 activities uh, that we are monitoring right now, where we have uh, typical activities like uh, shipping, uh, shipbuilding, um, marine aquaculture, um, but also uh, energy, uh, obviously, but uh, even administrations, I know, public administrations, they do contribute to the ocean economy themselves, not only by providing contracts to private actors, but themselves, very often in actually being part of the ocean economy. Typically, you know, the US Navy or the navies of the world, they're also part more broadly of the ocean economy. So indeed, when you take a look at the many, many activities that take place in the ocean, it's quite broad um, with major externalities down the road on the ocean. So I hope that helps a little bit. There's this blueprint on measuring the ocean economy that you can check out. And we have a new OECD website that we are putting together uh, where you'll have more information on the OECD Ocean Economy Monitor that actually also will provide many indicators accessible to everybody. Thank you very much, Claire. So I think with this uh, last question, we can close uh, the session and uh, I will uh, give back the floor to Nicolas for the uh, wrap up of the world event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alice. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, this has been the fastest two hours uh, for a long time. I think uh, it's been a really, really interesting discussion and uh, lots of things to digest. Um, I've been trying to just put together some of the major conclusions that I think uh, that stuck out to me today um, because so many things were touched upon. Um, I think it's become very clear from the conversation that the need for biodiversity observation is very evident. I mean, the, there's no real question about that this is important. However, there is still a long way to go to demonstrate the worth. People know it's there, but to start putting, people mentioned open safe since they can hands in pockets. Concrete, tangible outcomes are really, really important. And there is a lot of us in that, um, that group of people that have a lot of work to do to make it so. As part of that demonstration of worth, it's clear that we need to lose, use language and concepts that are understood by many different stakeholders. Far too often, we're looking at jargon, we're looking at very complex conversations that are very difficult to access, and we need to broaden that up and move the technical towards a level of understanding that is relevant for everyone. I think it's also been quite clear, and it's also good to hear constructive criticism, but clearly the academic world needs to step up. We have debated this a long time. We indeed debate this internally. We have panels like this on many occasions over the last few years, but it's not being heard. So there is clear, uh, clearly a challenge issued here that we get much more involved um, and that we stop just discussing these things as academic problems. And I think it's important that the academic sector becomes much more sensitive as well to the potential real world applications of its work, not just mired in uh, academic concepts and what we would like to see, but what the stakeholders, what our society and what the people that pay for it want to hear and want to see. These things need to be explained in terms that they understand. The need to involve many stakeholders are really, is really clear, I think. Um, and I think we've also heard, uh, I think uh, Pooja did a really nice job of explaining the different motivators and what are the different steps we can take to get many stakeholders engaged. And that's very encouraging to hear that it is indeed a problem that is being looked at from many different perspectives. Regulation is clearly key. Um, regulation has come up several times. And if we'd done a word cloud, I think this would be one of the main things that stuck out. But the regulations need to be clear. It needs to be grounded in science. So they need to be robust. 
they, and they need to be defined targets and they need to have indicators. It needs to be heavily regulated or heavily regulated is perhaps not the right word, but it needs to be crystal clear what is measured and how that can be impactful. And finally, uh, and unfortunately this is a question we couldn't dwell into as much as I hope we would, is the financing. So this has come up many times. There are many different options, but the financing of a sustained marine observation system is clearly still missing. And this is a major challenge ahead. I think this is heavily re uh, related to many of the aspects uh, that we've discussed. So the demonstration of worth, the inclusion of academia, the need of stakeholders, and indeed the regulation. So I think this is something that we can move towards, but I think this still comes back to demonstrating worth. So these are all things that we will try and deal with uh, in our uh, policy recommendations moving forward. I'd like to think that conversations like this one that has been enabled by the G20 is really a good step in the right direction. I think it's been a very broad discussion today. I think it's been really uh, nice to hear all the different perspectives rather than just hearing from one different sector, which we do very often. And hopefully this will then also be reflective in our report. And so that brings me on to the next steps of where we go from now. So we have about two months now to, to draft a white paper. Um, indeed, we'll be coming back to all of the panelists to make sure that we have represented your perspectives and points of views correctly. There'll probably be more questions we didn't have time to deal with today. So I strongly invite you to get involved in the process as much as you would like to. Um, and I think that's uh, all we can say for now. We know that the G20 will use these white papers for their own recommendations that will be coming out this autumn. And certainly I look forward to see what will come out of them and hope that the, our input will be reflected there. So I would like to just finish now since we are now slightly running over and just by finishing to say, say first of all, thank you to all our speakers. Really appreciate the time that you've taken to come and join us today and provide us with so much of your insight and time. Um, I really appreciate it. And to, these are important moving our discussions forward. Um, I also would like to, to thank my team internally. So Alice for taking on the role of co-moderating and following the, the chat and all that's been going on in there. To Camilla Tolik, who's been uh, instrumental in all of the orchestration of this event, which has been far from simple and I think Herding cats most definitely comes to, to mind here. Uh, to Christina Pavludi and Tosca Sala as well for all your technical support in the background. You guys are what makes it work and nobody gets to hear or see from you. So thank you so much. Um, and I'd also like to just send a special thanks to the Oceans 20 uh, team who's been super in the background, been providing a load of information, always stepping in whenever it was ready, uh, whenever it was necessary, sorry. So thank you to all of you that make the event happen. Thank you to everyone who came today and listened to what we have to say. Um, I thank you for your time and I hope you will enjoy the output of the discussions in the long run. So thank you everyone and have a nice continued Monday. Thank you. Thank you, bye. <laughs>